It's ten times the terror. Hello there. Hey everybody, welcome to Ten Times the Terror. My name is Ralph. And I'm Paul. And today we are going to discuss the time machine and time travel because we have as our very special guest, Dr. Ronald Mallett, who uh, received his BS, MS, and PhD in physics from Pennsylvania State in 1975. And uh, he joined the physics faculty at the University of Connecticut where he's currently the Professor Emeritus and Research Professor of Physics. Quite impressive. Uh, professor Mallard has published numerous papers in black holes and cosmology and professional journals, but his breakthrough research has been on time travel, and he's been featured extensively in print and broadcast media around the world. And uh, he's appeared in a full-length documentary called How to Build a Time Machine. We're going to get into that in a few minutes which won, by the way, the best documentary at the 2017 Philip Dick Film Festival. Philip Dick was the sci-fi author, wasn't he? Yeah, uh, that's right. Oh, yeah. Right. right. Sure. New York City. Uh, the documentary is now available at Amazon Prime, and so are his, his many works that you can find on YouTube, his videos, uh, his published memoir, Time Traveler, A Scientist Personal Mission to Make Time Travel a Reality. That's quite a title. <laughs> has been translated into Korean, Chinese, Japanese. How about Klingon? How about Klingon? <laughs> going to Klingon? And it's currently in discussion, and it's become a major, uh, it's, it's in discussion to become a major Hollywood motion picture. Well, I know something about movies and producing film, and I know when they say it's uh, in discussion, uh, it, it's quite a, it's quite a, uh, undertaking isn't it to oh, get a, a film from the script into the hands of the crew and into the hands of production i mean that people think you know you got a great story so let's make a movie but oh, no. uh, it takes a lot of time <laughs> and, no, and there's, a, there's a long history right. uh, here uh may i call you ronald uh, oh yeah please ron uh, uh watching your website it's another piece of um of, of ralph and my uh, interest which are collecting comic books Ah, and yes. I think we read there that you you began this whole thing by with the uh, the classic illustrated comic book version of the time machine. You're absolutely right. That that was. I, that was I, the thing I that have a collection to this life. day of horror and sci-fi classic illustrated. Although I don't, I think I think I'm not sure I have the time machine or not. I have War of the Worlds and Invisible Man and a few others. But uh, yeah, yeah, that was an introduction for a whole generation long before you had uh, Cliff Notes and everything. You had those. Classic yeah. illustrated comic book versions. <laughs> well, we're we're going to get in. We're going to get into your uh, story on how you how you got into this and a little bit of your theory. But uh, we we want to just talk a, a few minutes about the book and the film itself as a review. And uh, the the book, as as most of us know, uh, that H. G. Wells uh, wrote was done way back. In 1895, I mean, yeah. uh, come on, that's a long time ago, and uh, he certainly was a visionary. And um, I think, in, in my in my mind, because you know, for, speaking for myself, I, I've read an awful lot of science fiction. I still do. I do think that the time machine, in my mind, has to be the greatest short story sci-fi ever done because it, it, it incorporates everything. I mean. You know, it's it's not pandemic. It, 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 it's short. You can read that that whole that whole story in an afternoon. And uh, he draws you, doesn't he, Dr. Mal? He draws you into the story because he has that, you know, that persona there of, of being someone that's that's right there. And uh, the whole the whole scene, I mean, the, the imagery. Now, I, I want to ask you. Just a quick question. Uh, what do you think about Wells as he's explaining time travel? Obviously, it's very different, a very different time scientifically. But is there any, you know, were you impressed at all with the science that he's ex trying to explain to his comrades? Well, yeah, I mean, the thing <coughs> is that you're absolutely right. Now. I mean, one of the things that he does is he introduces the uh, narrator as uh, someone who's visiting the time traveler. Right. And the thing is, is that, to me, what impressed me 
later, even more than that, the initially is the fact that Wells actually explicitly talks about the fourth dimension. And the thing is, is that he is the first. And this was before Einstein's theory didn't come out until 1905, 10 years later. And Wells introduces time as the fourth dimension explicitly. And there had been actually talk about mathematicians about a fourth dimension, but they were they were actually talking about a fourth dimension of space. And what Wells did was to actually introduce the notion of time as a fourth dimension. And the way in which he did it uh, really, in fact, he talks about the concept of time. One of the other things that's impressive is he actually tries to give a definition of time. Uh, he connects it with the notion of duration. He, in fact, as he's talking as a time traveler uh, and the way in which he mentions it, he doesn't give the time traveler a name. He just actually calls him a time traveler. Right. He says that uh, when he's introducing the concept to his friends, he talks about the three dimensions of space. But he said, let's talk about a cube. Now, we know that a cube has, you know, length, width and, and a height. But can an instantaneous cube exist? In other words, can a cube that has no duration exist? And so this notion of time as being related to duration was something that impressed me as a kid. Uh, but as I said later, his note, the fact that he brings in time as the fourth dimension. So it's, it's, he actually tries to educate the reader about the notion of time as being something that you should be able to travel along just as you do the other dimensions of space. And in fact, that was the thing that was so impressive to me. In the Classics Illustrated version, in fact, uh, the very first thing that they see is that uh, scientific people know very well that time is just a kind of space. And we can move forward and backward in time just as we can in space. That was the thing that, that caught me as a child. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, Wells is, Wells is what I would call, and it's very rare that you find a sci- a sci-fi writers today like Wells. Wells is very much a prophetical type of sci-fi author. Uh, He's looking into the future, and he has a mix of humanity, you know, a real sense of humanism. But he also is a very has a very pessimistic view at times. You know, when you go into the island of Doctor Moreau, or Mm -hmm. War of the Worlds, or you know, there's nothing I don't think in any sci-fi literature is bleak in my mind as the Time Machine when he goes to the far reaches of the future. You know, where he sees that ending of the sun. Uh, it, it's fa- it's fascinating for his period to actually talk about, the, you know, the sun just becoming uh, lifeless, if you would. And you had that scene, I know, that you remember at the end where this thing comes out of the ocean, yes. flopping around. And, uh, of course, you don't know where it goes beyond that because, uh, you know, we're talking about the planet, not the universe. Fascinating book. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, the thing is, is it was extremely fascinating. And uh, the his whole you're right. It was actually a sociological as well as scientific thing, because he talks about how the human race split itself up between the Eloy and the Murlocs. And that was a very pessimistic. Oh, yeah. Essentially, what right. he was saying the extremely rich would become these effete, uh, useless creatures in the future. And the workers would become this dark creature, the Morlocks. And it was actually, yeah. you know, he actually yeah. have a very pessim- I had an optimistic view of how the human race might evolve if things were kept the way that they were going. So, Go ahead, Paul. I was going to say it's it's reminiscent of uh, Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Oh, yeah. You have you know, you know, you, yes, you've yes. divided the classes into the, those above and then those down below uh, who are more like the drones, you know, just uh, working away, yes. you know, with no real no real human nature to them. How did you uh, find the movie? Were... Oh, you mean the movie, The Time Machine? Well, the thing is, is that for me, it was extremely impressive because the fact that it was so close to the book. In fact, of all the different versions of the movie versions of The Time Machine, that the 1965 version, which uh, I mean, actually 1960, I'm sorry, the 1960 version of The Time Machine with Rod Taylor was right was the most accurate in fact he did they did something in the movie which is rarely done in hollywood feature films they usually jump right into the action and i and i, I other comments <coughs> have mentioned this too is the fact that they actually spend a long time with the time traveler talking to, with his friends 
and getting people prepared for the notion of the time machine. And that was something that was very impressive. Uh, the fact that he actually goes through in the, uh, you know, Rod Taylor is the time traveler in the movie. Right. And the fact that he actually spends time trying to convince his friends of the possibility of time travel. And he goes through the notion of talking about the three dimensions of space and how time is the fourth dimension. That you never see in any of the other movies. They they actually, as I said, they jump right into the action without yeah. the build up. Yeah. And, yeah. They, and and uh, the other thing is is that I thought was extremely impressive in the movie is how they get the notion of you know in the book the uh, time traveler talks about looking at a, the a picture of someone at different stages of their life. The way they translate that into the movie is they have this friend of his, David, and he meets David at different points and he meets his, his son David uh, in fact at the beginning of the movie uh, his friend David has a, a, a little boy and as a baby and then the thing is is that the time traveler encounters that baby as a young man uh, just having come back from the first world war and then he has him uh, later at in his 60s when he's an old man so uh, literally, you get the impression of what a time traveler would encounter as far as people are concerned. First as a baby, then as a young man, and then as an as an elderly man. So yeah, all yeah. of that in the movie was just was just incredible. And then of course there was the journey of the time traveler, you know, getting to the future itself. And it was like the far distant future. I, I just thought the movie was just so beautiful. The other thing that I loved about the movie was the fact that. Normally, in a lot of science fiction movies, they have the uh, scientist as some kind of uh, real weirdo, okay? Uh, right. He's either, uh, you know, a geek or something. And here, yeah. the time traveler was considered one of the leading men of his time, Rod Taylor. Mm -hmm. And yeah. to me, I really love that, the fact that they didn't have him as some weird person, mm -hmm. but they just had him as a passionate human being. Because really, that's the way scientists are. They're passionate human beings, but they're normal in any other way. And to me, that was that actually helped me. Right. To, to the notion of becoming a scientist wouldn't mean that I would have to become sort of strange. Yeah. Human. Right. You know, it yeah. also reminds well, me. It, it reminds me of Lost Horizon, uh, where you where time seems to stand still. Right. That uh, whoever the Dr. Dalai Lama figure. Uh, uh, who seems to be, you know, eternal, you know, he, or he, he just keeps living. And uh, the idea that, uh, you know, the lead character, Ronald Coleman, right. and it's not going back in time, but it's going to a place where time doesn't function the way our time does. That, you know, you know that film or that book? Yeah, I'm not that's, familiar with that. That's sort of the idea. And it, it's a little reminiscent of that. Uh, in this case, it, it's, it's, uh, Shangri La is like a is like a paradise, and uh, that's the other thing about it. It's you know it's, yeah. it's sort of like St. So, Louis's view of, of Venus and Mars, where there's no sin, there's no evil. Um, so, but it has that kind of idea of like going into a, another dimension. You mentioned the fourth dimension. Uh, that film was made in 1937, right? Um, and I think it's been remade since then. But that's the definitive version. So, Ron, your your uh, your story begins not with the physical sciences, but it's very much an emotional uh, crisis that starts you on the road to this whole idea of time travel. Why don't you just give us a little bit of background on that? Oh, yeah, sure, Ralph, because, in fact, uh, that you're absolutely right. The beginning for me was a highly emotional beginning. Uh, I grew up in the Bronx, New York, and I was the oldest of four children. And my father was a television repairman. Uh, he had been a, a battlefield medic in the Second World War, and he used the GI Bill to become an electronic technician when he got out. Of, of, of. And he, uh, for me, the sun rose and set on him. He was a larger than life person. And he was he was serious, but he was also fun. He loved having a family. And he spent a lot of time with me, giving me a lot of attention. Uh, he gave me scientific toys like a gyroscope and a crystal radio set. And he told me about how things function. And I, I, I adored him. Thing is, is he looked healthy and he looked robust, but we didn't know that he had a weak heart. And he died suddenly of a massive heart attack when he was only 33. And I was mm. 10 years old at the time. 
And to say that it shattered my world is actually an understatement. I literally, after he died, I didn't care whether I lived or died. But I went from being a really happy kid to being a really depressed kid. Yeah, who yeah. were worried about me. The thing is, is that he loved to read. And that was another gift he gave me. And about a year after he died, when I was 11, I came across the Classics Illustrated version of the, that, of the book that changed my life. Literally changed right. my life. It was The mm-hmm. Time Machine by H.G. Wells. And it, when I mentioned that the statement at the very beginning of the magazine, which said scientific people know very well that right. time and space, and we can move forward and backward in time just as we can in space. I knew that was, for me, the life preserver. Wait a minute. If I could go back in time, I could see him again and tell him what was going to happen and maybe change his life. So yeah. that, was, that was actually the very beginning of my journey. But, Ron, you know, you don't give yourself credit sometimes. And a lot of kids have had their dad die. A lot of kids have gone through some of the crisis. They've turned to drugs or they turned to, you know, all kinds of problems. Let's face it, Ron, you're a genius. I mean, <laughs> all the emotions and sadness and good wishes to get to see, you know, those, those kinds of things could not have happened if God did not give you a, a, a huge intellect, right? Well, I mean, thank you. I mean, I, I think that I inherited a passion for uh, trying to understand things. And, and the thing is, is that and, I, it, and algebra did come easy for me. Eventually, I found out that math was something that especially uh, that type of math which uh, it it came quite easily to me. And that was a gift. But the thing is, is that the passion for reading was a gift from my father. And the Mm -hmm. fact is, is I, I, as a kid, I actually tried to put something together that resembled the cover of the magazine uh, on the time machine. And uh, from my old, the radio parts and TV parts that my father left behind. And I tried to jerry rig something with bicycle parts. And of course, nothing worked. But what I remembered, it said that scientific people know very well. And so I knew science was going to have to play a role. Fortunately for me, I was a bookaholic. I used to, after uh, my father died, we actually uh, went from the middle class to poverty. I don't know how my mother did it. I mean, this was, she was, uh, you know, I'm an African-American and she's an African-American. And (coughs) it was very rough for an African-American woman in the 50s. But I can imagine. Together. And I used to hang out at the uh, Salvation Army bookstore where uh, you could get books for a nickel. And I came across the second book that changed my life. I was probably around 12 and it had a picture of Einstein. I didn't know what Einstein did, but I knew he was this great genius. Incidentally, he died in the same year that my father died in 1905. That's always been something that's intrigued me. And it, it had a picture of Einstein on the cover of this paperback. He was standing next to an hourglass. So I tried, I put two and two together. I thought, here's this great genius, and he's standing next to an hourglass. Maybe this Einstein has something to do with time. So I got a copy of the book, and lo and behold, I couldn't understand. Even I didn't have enough background, even though it was a popularization. But right. I picked up the fact that it said that Einstein said that unlike the, the physics of Newton, where nothing can change time, Einstein said time can be altered. And so I thought, wait a minute, if Einstein says that you could alter time, maybe a time machine is possible. So what I have to do is to understand <clears throat> Einstein. So that was the beginning of the other journey, was that I had wanted to dedicate myself to understanding Einstein so that I could build a time machine. So if I understand this right, there, Einstein had, first of all, the, the special theory of relativity that says time can be affected by motion right that the faster we move the more time slows down that's exactly right ralph uh, his his uh, special theory of relativity in a nutshell said that time is affected by speed and uh, then you had the time. general theory that says time slows down through gravity that's right the, the general theory of relativity which was developed the, the special theory was developed in 1905 as i said uh, essentially 10 years after hg wells wrote his book and it introduces the concept of the fourth dimension uh, mathematically. And his second theory was developed 10 years after that in 1915. And it said that uh, time is affected by gravity. And we actually know experimentally, both of those things have been demonstrated. It has been demonstrated experimentally that time is affected by speed. In fact, the um, a large scale version of that experiment was done in 1971 that most people don't know about. 
what they did was they took two atomic clocks. One atomic clock was kept at rest at the Naval Observatory. The other clock was put on an ordinary passenger jet and flown around the world to speed of sound. When they brought the passenger jet back, they found that the clock on the passenger jet had actually slowed down exactly in the way that Einstein predicted. Now, the, it was only by fractions of a second because the effect depends on speed. And even though the speed of sound is very fast compared to the speed of light, it's slow. And so it was yeah. just by microseconds. If we have rockets that can, will eventually get, go close to the speed of light, they'll never be able to get to the speed of light. But if, when we have rockets that can go close to the speed of light, we'll see a dramatic effect in which we'll see not only that it's time slows down, but we will actually a uh, time travel. And when I talk about a clock, it's important to remember that your heart is a clock. This means that if you were traveling fast enough, your heart rate would slow down <clears throat> compared to other people and your metabolism would slow down. You would not age at the same rate. So if you were traveling very fast in a very fast rocket, you only years might be passing for you, but decades could be passing for everyone else here on the earth. And in fact, it was a great uh, science fiction movie that got it right and illustrated that. And that was uh, the original Planet of the Apes, uh, the 1968 right. with uh, uh, Charles, Charles Heston. They actually got it right because they these uh, astronauts had actually traveled out in space and came back and they had landed on the earth decades later because they had been traveling so close to the speed of light. So that was one of the few science fiction movies that actually utilizes uh, Einstein's special theory of relativity. Okay, so if I understand if I understand this right, and then not, you know you can certainly give us a little more detail. But in in your in your in your um, your whole design here is based on the fact that light can alter time, and so the basis of the time machine, if I'm understanding this, is with lasers, you can twist time into a loop. Well, yeah. Rather right. than go in, a, in yeah. a linear. You have you have part of it. In, in fact, though, but but uh, remember, I was saying that uh, Einstein had two theories. One was right. the special theory of relativity, which says time is affected by speed. Okay. That in that theory, you can travel to the future, essentially, but you can't go back to the past. Okay. Now, it's the general theory of relativity. Which, as I said, was uh, came out ten years later. It, that says that time is affected by gravity. That's important <clears throat> because that's the basis of my work, and I have we have to back up here to see what's happening here. In other words, according to Einstein, the stronger gravity is, the more time will slow down. Okay. Now, the thing is, is that in Einstein's theory, remember now we said that Einstein showed that light. I mean, that gravity can affect time. So the connection here is that if gravity can affect time, and in Einstein's theory, light can create gravity. So if gravity can affect time and light can create gravity, then light can affect time. That's the basis of my work. And what I found was that there's a certain particular circulating pattern of light that can create a circulating gravitational field. There's a device that's called a ring laser. Essentially, it's a device that has, consists of mirrors that light bounces off of it. It creates just a circulating pattern of light. Just imagine light going into a loop. And what I found was that mathematically, I solved Einstein's gravitational field equations, and I was able to show that this circulating pattern of light can cause a twisting of space. And in Einstein's theory, space and time are connected to each other. Whatever it is that you do to space also happens to time. So if I can twist space with the circulating beam of light, I can actually twist time to a loop. So imagine that I have a, a piece of paper, and along that piece of paper, I draw a straight line. That's a timeline. That's the way all of us live normally. In other words, the, at the bottom of that line is the past. The middle of that line is the present, and the top of the line is the future. So we all live along that line. Now imagine that I take that straight line and I make it into a loop. Then we can go from the past to the present to the future, but I've made a loop out of this so I can go from the future back into the past. So by using a circulating beam of laser light, I can actually twist space and I can twist time into a loop and I can travel back into the past. So in essence, this is a 
a laser generated time machine. Now, is that the same as a closed timeline curve? Yes, in fact, it's a call. In fact, the uh, physicists call it a CTC, which is closed time curve. And right. uh, whenever, in fact, it's interesting that you mentioned that, Ralph, because when physicists write their technical papers, they don't mention explicitly a time machine or time travel path. Their code name for it is closed time loop. So whenever you see a physicist talking about CTCs, they're actually talking about time machine, time travel to the past. So this is, and there's other ways that it could be done. My way, as I said, was by using a circulating beam of laser light. And as I said, I was able to, to find that out by solving Einstein's gravitational field equations. And now, the wormhole, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say, the other ways that it can be done is black holes. Black right. holes have an extremely strong gravitational field. And the closer you get to a black hole, the more time will slow down, okay? Now, but in addition to that, if a black hole happens to be rotating, a rotating black hole will cause a twisting of space, and that twisting of space will cause closed loops in time. That has been shown mathematically also. So a rotating black hole could cause loops in time that would allow you to go back into the past. So they create these closed time loops as well. Now, there are other ways of uh, traveling back into the past. Wormholes are another possibility as well. All of these are based on solutions of Einstein's gravitational field equation. That's the other reason why I have confidence in what I've done, is that the, all the work that I've done, and in fact, it's important to realize that when people talk about these things, if the work that they're looking at is based on Einstein's theories, then you should give it some credence. If it's not, then you should be skeptical of it. Okay? So why has so, Stephen Hawkins been critical of your of your theory. Well, he hasn't he hasn't been critical of my theory in particular. He's oh, been I'm critical of he's been critical of the, the notion of time travel to the past by any of these means, by wormholes or, or rotating black holes. Okay. So he's been critical and the reason for it is he says that if and it's and it sounds on the surface of it reasonable. If time travel to the past is possible, okay, then how come we haven't seen any time travel? And in fact he actually set up a party one time uh, in which that's he right. Time travel to the back. The no one came. reason for it, which was which was overlooked and now is generally understood. Uh, Says so you you can't go back into time and uh, uh, try to persuade Abraham Lincoln not to go to the theater. Well, that, that's exactly that's exactly right, Paul. The thing is, is that what that means is that you can't go back earlier than when the device was turned on. Literally, what. They had what had been overlooked by Hawking is the fact that a, a real terrestrial time machine just simply hasn't been created because you can't go back earlier than that. Now, this mm -hmm. happens for any process, though. For instance, remember, I was talking about rotating black holes creating loops in time. You can't go back earlier than when the rotating black hole was formed. And the same with uh, wormholes. You can't go back in time earlier than when the wormhole was formed. This is the reason mm -hmm. why. The movies don't get it quite right, okay? You can't go back earlier than that. Now, the thing is, is that, of course, this doesn't discount the fact that we might be able to go back to distant past. Let's suppose, you know, we know now, physicists know now, that there are what are known as extra, they're called extrasolar planets, okay? These are planets now that we know orbit other solar systems. This wasn't known generally until the 90s, by the way. But now we know that. Now physicists, in fact, have come to the conclusion that, you know, that there are special class of these <coughs> planets. In other words, in fact, you can guess by the name they call it. There are some planets that are probably too close to their sun for life. There are some planets that are far, probably too far away from their sun for life. But there is a special class of planets that uh, physicists have now called Goldilocks planets. These are planets that are just right. And we feel that they are probably the universe is probably teeming with these type of planets. This means that life is probably possible out there in the universe. Now, what this is is now this is not science fiction anymore. This is actually part of real uh, physics. What it, this means that suppose that there are planets out there that had a time machine that they had turned on, let's say, uh, ten thousand years ago. 
they would still have the same limitation. But now suppose that we eventually are able to visit those planets. If their machine was had been turned on for 10,000 years and we use their machine, it is in principle possible that we might be able to go back and visit our distant past eventually. But of course, that means that we have to find these planets and they have to have built a time machine that has been on for right. millennia. But that means that it, in, in principle, our distant past may in fact be in principle visible uh, eventually. Okay, I have a question here on, on this. Um, uh, I think a lot of people uh, are not familiar with the term, but they are. They they understand the the logic. Could you just touch on the grandfather paradox, number one, and how a, a number of scientists are believing in uh, believing that there are multi uh, universes, and uh, how that could you know how that could work through that paradox and the. The, the the other question I would have in relationship to that is: Does your time machine work if there is no multi-universe? So uh, I threw some things out there. I'd like to get yeah. to understand. Oh, sure, no, they're and they're all connected to each other. But, but let's start back with the uh, notion of the grandfather paradox. Okay, what the grandfather paradox <clears throat> essentially means is that, and I'm going to use the less uh, violent form of it. Suppose that you travel back to the past and prevent your grandfather from meeting your grandmother. There's a much more violent form of that, which I don't particularly like. But suppose, <laughs> you, but suppose you go back and just prevent him from marrying uh, uh, your grandmother. If your grandfather never meets your grandmother, they never get together. And so they never have your parents. And if they don't have their, your parents, then your parents don't have you. But if your parents don't have you... How were you able to go back into the past to prevent your grandfather from meeting your grandmother? That's called the grandfather paradox. That's the classic form of it. OK, now, the thing is, is that uh, and that seems to preclude the notion of, of time travel. However, there is another possibility, but everything that we've been talking about so far, it depends on Einstein's theories of relativity. The other is there's two major pillars of modern physics. One is relativity. The other major pillar is quantum physics, quantum mechanics. That's those are the two pillars of modern physics. And we haven't talked about that. It turns out that quantum mechanics brings in things that uh, affect time travel in a wholly different way. And to mention that possibility, back in 1957, there was a physicist named Hugh Everett the first third, sorry. Uh, at Princeton. And for his PhD thesis, he actually developed, uh, he applied quantum mechanics to the universe as a whole. Now, quantum mechanics, one of the things that quantum mechanics says is that you cannot predict exactly what's going to happen next. You can only predict the probability of what's going to happen next. This is based on a lot of things. One of them is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, but it says you cannot predict exactly what uh, Everett did was to apply quantum theory to the universe as a whole. And what he found was the following interesting thing. Suppose that there's, um, and I'll, I'll use a simple example. Suppose that uh, you go to a restaurant and you have a menu and there's item A on the menu and item B on the menu. And suppose that you decide to choose item B. At the moment you choose item B, there is actually a split of the universe. The universe actually splits into two separate tracks. These tracks are both real and separate from each other. There's a Ralph who has chosen item B on the menu. However, there was a split. There is actually another whole universe in which there is a Ralph who's chosen item A on the menu. These two universes are separate. They don't know about each other and they're just as real. And this this is actually a consequence of Everett's theory. It was called the many worlds interpretation. Now it's more popularly called the parallel universe interpretation. But originally the technical name was the many worlds interpretation. So what this means is there was there are multiple splits happening for all of us anytime we have a choice. So there was a physicist uh, who not many years ago actually realized that this had implications for time travel. His name is, uh, let's see, I'm trying, uh, it's, oh, David Deutsch, and he's a professor at Oxford. And what Deutsch did was 
to apply Everett's theory to time travel to the past. What he found was the fact that a time traveler, when they travel back to the past, as soon as they arrive in the plant past, there's a split of the universe. He arrives in a parallel universe. In that universe, he can actually prevent his grandfather from meeting his grandmother. But there's no par- there's no paradox there because he'll never be born in that universe, but he didn't come from that universe in the first place. So he would just simply find himself in a strange universe in which he was never born. And that's fine because there's no paradox. But however, remember I said there was a split. The other, the other one, he doesn't arrive in that universe. In that universe, his, his grandparents meet each other and they have him. Okay. So what it says is that the, that the split of the universe into parallel universes means that a time traveler can travel back into the past, but the past they arrive in is not the past that they came from. And that would resolve, okay, theoretically, the paradox. Because, and so a time traveler going back to the past. So that's, that's why people have speculated that on the basis of this mini world or parallel world, interpretation of quantum mechanics that allows for time travel to the past yeah you're able to affect the past of past universes now of uh, course yeah. we don't know until yeah. we are able to do the experiment we don't know that this happens but this says that quantum mechanics could affect how time travel actually occurs okay. so okay i just jump in here um this is sounding remarkably similar to J.R.R. tolkien's concept of the land of fairy which is a parallel world to our world. Yeah, well, uh, a lot of these things have been based on uh, the, 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 they're, 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 this notion of parallel <coughs> worlds has actually been in science fiction, but this is the real scientific basis of it. Mm-hmm. Was, uh, what, what, uh, and, and it was something that was actually done on the basis of quantum physics. So that, was, that's, that, that actually gives it a, a firm scientific fa- foundation. Well, we want to we want to give Paul some time just to get into a little bit of the uh, because both of us are very much into theology. I, I, I'm sure Paul's got some questions, but let me just end sure. my part here. If you had all the money in the world, do 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 does science uh, do you be, feel that you you would be able to put the hardware together to make this right now, or are we not at that point to actually make it? Well, I. Th- that's a good question. That's actually a good question. The thing is, is that that the research that I'm doing is actually split into two pieces. And I try to, to mention that to people. Remember, I said that the circulating beam of light will cause a twisting of space. OK. And that that twisting of space will eventually lead to a twisting of time. That's those two stages are both there. They're separate, but they depend on each other. The first stage is to actually show that a circulating beam of light can cause a twisting of space. The uh, I should say the financial output for that is in the millions. okay, and that's so it's doable and it is actually doable within a finite amount of time. The second part, however, is that you have to actually show that the twisting of space is sufficiently strong to cause the twisting of time. That turns out the energy requirements for that turned out to be gargantuan. okay, and. We don't know really whether or not that would be possible. Theoretically, it sounds as though it might not be, but quantum physics has not been put into that portion of the theory yet. So, but it, we've, we need to do the first part. So the answer of your question is, is that there's an uncertainty here. First, we have to see whether the twisting of space due to the circulating beam of light actually will occur. And that has not been shown yet. That was my theoretical prediction based on solving Einstein's equations. Mathematicians have a statement of this. It's called uh, necessary and sufficient conditions is the way mathematicians would put it. The twisting of space is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. So if I had all the money that was needed, I wouldn't even need all of that money. But that would be first, I would find out whether I had the necessary conditions solved. That would teach us what we need to know as far as getting sufficient conditions. So I can say the first part, yes. The second part, I don't know. 
And that's and, the nature of science. And you have said, and you have said that um, it's much more probable that the, the practical outcome of this machine would not be so much for people to take rides in the future or the past, but to be uh, an alert system oh, where yeah. uh, people can send a message uh, of an incoming disaster, which which scares me in some ways, Ron, because anytime we've come up with these huge jumps in technology, the governments, governments step in and make it a military secret that they use for their own end. That, I mean... However, the problem is, is that that's so with any technology. But it's and, true, right? And and the thing is, is that we need to be careful that just because of the fact that we think that we shouldn't engage in something because of the fact that it could lead to these ethical questions, and these ethical questions are extremely important, extremely important. Uh, I hope that we'll get into that with uh, you know with Paul uh, if we're, we're talking about that. But the thing is, is that but. Just because we don't think we should engage in it, that doesn't mean once it's known that it's possible. Okay. <laughs> and you've remember, opened Pandora's box. Right, right, right. <laughs> remember, I said uh, that my book has been my book, Time Traveler. That's actually the, the main name of the book, Time Traveler. My book, Time Traveler, actually has been translated into Korean, Japanese, and Chinese. Right. If you look at the basic equation that I've written, that's and this is the power of science. There's an equation that I came up with that shows how space is twisted by a circulating beam of light. If you look at those books, the language, I don't I can't read any of those languages. However, my equation in that book and the book is non-technical, but they still put in my equation there. The equation looks exactly the same, exactly the same in Chinese, Korean and Japanese. What does that mean? That means that any scientist in the world can use the scientific formulas that were developed independently of me. So uh, here's my, what I've speculated. If, for instance, the CIA tomorrow found out that Korea, North Korea, was working on the possibility of a time machine, I would probably have more money than I knew what to do with. But that's the way real the real world works. Real politics, especially in this country, is a catch up. It's when we find out that someone else is engaged in it that all of a sudden we become interested in becoming right. engaged in it. OK, Paul, the show is yours. Where is he when you need him? Hey, Paul. Yeah, here, here I am. Here I am. Uh, one question I have, Ron, um, from a more philosophical or theological one is. Uh, what about the concept of eternity? Does that have any place here? Well, I mean, the, the thing is, is that it doesn't really affect the concept of eternity. I mean, you know, we, we, we live temporally. Uh, let me mention, by the way, to both of you, uh, that I'm a religious person, by the way, because people sometimes wonder about, you know, you know the scientific, uh, scientists. And one of the unfortunate things is people sometimes think that, uh, many scientists are not. Uh, it turns out that that people get this notion because many of the more popular publicized scientists aren't. But many in the scientific community are religious. OK, it's right. not just simply myself. OK, but I am a religious person. I actually happen to believe in a, in a higher deity and, and I'm a religious person. So with that out of the way. Uh, so the, 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 Paul. It doesn't really address the notion of since we live in a temporal realm, all of the things I'm talking about are what happened in this realm. OK, uh, so it, you might say that it's sort of independent of the of an eternity. OK, yeah, I think, you know, you have a statement like this in the New Testament. Uh, uh, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. But remember that things happen here in a temporal realm. OK, Christ came mm -hmm. into the world, was born and died. And that's temporal. OK, so 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 everything that I'm talking about is in the, the physical temporal world. It's like the guardian of forever in Star Trek. That could be a reference to God, really, because oh, that, you that, enter oh. into that. Uh, it's a temporal thing, but someone's beyond the temporal that is, you know, sovereign over that. 
Yeah, and Ron, did, did you see the film? Uh, sci- sci- uh, I, that, uh, that was one of my favorite episodes of uh, Star Trek, was City on the Edge of Forever. Oh, uh, yeah. It's at that time gate that they had there. Yeah. But let me ask you this about uh, movies. Uh, you know the movie Avengers Endgame? Mm-hmm. Uh, where they do deal with time travel mm-hmm. at the end, you know, and you have um, Steve Rogers, Captain America, you know, uh, goes back in time to uh, dance with his uh, with, with his fiance that uh, that he never really knew uh, in the previous previous time. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, um, oh, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, right, oh, yeah, just, but in that movie, I mean, but in that movie, remember what he decides to do, which I thought was was beautifully done, was he decided not to come back to the present, but to live out his life along that 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 particular timeline. So mm-hmm. when when you meet him again, you meet him as an older man uh, who decided to live out his life in that particular period. In fact. Uh, when I tell people how they say, well, you know, how how would you know that your device probably worked? Uh, and one of the ways in which, you know, physicists do experiments that don't sound as dramatic as the things that happen in, in uh, the movies. But one of the ways you would know whether something actually went back into the past in a real potential experiment is the fact that, for example, there are subatomic particles that live for a particularly uh, short period of time, and then they disintegrate. And uh, the thing is, is that, but we suppose, however, that what you did, you know how long they are supposed to live. Now, suppose that you have uh, a, a particle that you sent back slightly into the past. When it arrives back into the future, it will actually be older, which means that it will actually decay sooner than we had expected because it is older. So that would be a way that we would actually know that it had rot in the past, is the fact that when it came back, it would actually be an older particle and would disintegrate sooner than it normally would have. So uh, that was actually a good, act, uh, a good representation of what would happen if someone traveled back in time and lived in that timeline. When they came back to what would have been their present, they would actually be older than they would have been. So he's a man in the 90s. Yeah. And you have the uh, and then the flashback we get is uh, 1946. Um, uh, with again, you know, the 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 young Steve Rogers with the young, uh, young fiance uh, dancing to um, uh, it's, uh, the song of that year. It's been a long, long time, you know. Right. Uh, it was very ironic that that's the song they picked. You know? <laughs> yeah. Now, that was beautiful. That was a beautiful representation in the movie. Okay. Well, that, you know, uh, it, the other thing, too, is, um, you know, they, we're in, in a Holy Week now. Um, well, this will be broadcast later, of course. But uh, there is that sense in which Jesus' death on the cross has cosmic implications. Uh, and that it, it can, in some ways, reverse time and space um you know you have this picture that that is very very hard to conceptualize in matthew's gospel that when jesus dies on the cross the graves open up and all kinds of people come back to life that yeah. that sounds like a mystery and it is a mystery yeah, and yeah. It is a mystery. well but but from the standpoint of physics that's not an answerable question yeah, I think that, you know, I think what you're saying basically is that you're you, you you are working in the physical. Right. As as theologians, we're working also in the spiritual, which is another type of dimension. But, you know, you know, when I was a kid, I was uh, fascinated with uh, astronomy. And um, unless I'm mistaken, we we are witnessing a time machine every time we look at something like the Great Spiral andromeda galaxy that okay. that's a million light years away had it been blown up a half a million years ago we wouldn't even know it uh, so we're looking at the reality of, of in some ways which is fascinating to consider yeah uh, well, exactly exactly and if, if paul if, if i could address if i could address uh, some uh, ethical 
issues that I think would be of mm-hmm. importance because it, it actually uh, interfaces with what Ralph was saying, which was, you know, what about the uses that this could be put to? When, when it happens, and it will happen, we're going to have to have a regulatory agency, just as we have for air travel. And in fact, uh, I think that's important for people to realize that they have to start thinking about the fact that these things will be possible. One of the movies that is a favorite of mine, because it's one of the few that that actually emphasizes the notion of having uh, some sort of a, a temporal agency, something along the line of Interpol, but for time travel. And it's a movie that is often overlooked is Time Cop. Uh, yeah. I thought that it was a great illustration of the fact that there's going to have to be regulations. The other thing that I think that science can sometimes provide, especially for a person who has a a religious uh, perspective, is the fact that there are things that we understand about the universe that can actually highlight our understanding about things. Uh, For example, we talk about the Trinity, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about the uh, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and and we we talk about the fact that. how can these things be separate with the same thing? And it turns out that relativity, by understanding relativity, it actually gives us a perspective. Here in the three-dimensional realm where the time and space are separate for us, we talk about three dimensions of space and the dimension of time. What relativity did was to actually say that when you go to a higher dimension, you can see that from the standpoint of four dimensions, that space and time are linked to each other. We see matter and energy as being separate at a temporal level. But when we look at it from the standpoint of a higher dimension, we can actually see that matter and energy are actually the same thing. And it's just the fact that we being at this temporal level, we see it as separate things. In other words, literally matter and energy, in a sense, can be changed into each other from a higher dimension. We could actually see that they're different aspects of the same thing. So it's just because we're in this lower dimensional plane that we see a notion of of uh, a trinity. There's actually sort of a, a, a from a higher dimension, we would actually be able to see that these are just all different aspects of the one. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, I'd like to close with this thought to you that sometimes, uh, especially in your life, because I lost my dad as a kid too. I know the pain that you had. And uh, you really feel like you're in another dimension just by the pain and loneliness. But in your mind, you know, you would love to go back. Um, For us in the Easter season, we, we go forward. We look to a time when we will see our loved ones again. At least that's the message of Jesus Christ, that uh, death is not the end, but the beginning of another realm of experience. And I pray that um, you will be united with your dad and he will be more beautiful and wonderful than you ever knew him. And that is the hope that I have. And I hope that that's a hope that you have been. We've had such a good time with you. And for a guy who is so smart, you're a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've had professors in college that were brilliant and they bored the tears out of us, but you've kept your sense of humor and your joy, and it's just a blessing to have you with us, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph. And thank you, Paul. Yeah, and I, I certainly agree. I, I would certainly I second that. Yes. You have a good you have a good day and a good future, Ron. God yes, bless you. Too. Thank you, you very much. To to. It's ten times the terror. <laughs> you are impossible. Ralph, you do your well intentioned but still you wrong. Thank you for listening to Ten Times the Terror. This podcast would not be possible without listeners like you. You can find out more about our podcast by visiting our website, 10timestheterror.com. That's 10xtheterror.com.